My story started in 1973, when I was 12 years old. That year, my dad passed away. And five months later, my mom passed away. So I went through middle school, high school, pretty much on my own. And when I graduated from high school, I took on several jobs. I worked in a bank, I worked in construction sites, I washed and waxed cars. Most of my classmates went on to pursue higher education. And I was sort of left behind. But I understood the circumstances I was in. I dealt with it and I moved on. Not until when I was 23 years old, when my friends graduated, they came back as engineers, doctors, they were in business management, in computers, accounting, and I was still washing and waxing cars. And that was not a good scenario. So I realized really quickly at that time that my life had to take a different path. So I went out and bought a college guidebook. Now remember back then, we didn't have websites, Google searches. So the guidebook pretty much summarizes everything. So as I gleaned through the pages, one thing I found in common, they are all horribly expensive. The ones that are a little are more affordable, they didn't have an engineering program, and I wanted to be an engineer. But there were two universities that were ranked well, and one of them is the University of Southwestern Louisiana, and the other one is the University of Texas at El Paso. So I applied to both of them. And about two months later, I received a rejection letter from Southwestern. And that was nerve wracking. But a week later, I received an acceptance letter from the University of Texas at El Paso. And it was a relief. Had I gotten two rejection letters, that would have meant the end of the road for me as far as pursuing higher education. So later that year, I sold everything I have. I had enough money for a $10,000 cashier's check, which is part of the F1 visa requirement back then. And I bought a one-way ticket to the Lone Star State of Texas. And I arrived one cold morning at Whataburger. <laughs> My strategy was really simple. Take as many credits as possible. When I'm about run out of money, I'll buy a ticket, go back, work, and come back again. It's a simple strategy. So that first year, I took 52 credit hours. In the spring, uh, summer and fall semesters. Well, you might think that's crazy, taking 52 credits a year. There's actually a crazier component to that, which I'll share with you later. So in the fall of that year, I received a competitive scholarship from the civil engineering department. And that allowed me to pay in-state tuition. And that helped a lot. But as most of you know, that paying in-state and take, taking a job at a student union 20 hours a week for $3.35 minimum wage back then was nearly not quite enough. You need more than that. But the fortunate thing is that the following semester, <clears throat> I was well into my junior year because of the number of credits I've taken. And there were a lot more scholarships for juniors and seniors. And I was beginning to enjoy college life, and it was really fun. I joined the American Society of Civil Engineers. I was with Chi Epsilon, and I enjoyed Chi Epsilon is because we focus a lot on fundraising. We sold hot dogs, nachos, popcorn, drinks, and all the home games at the Special Event Center, which we call it the Don Heskin Center now, and at the Sun Bowl. 
And later that year, they made me president of Chi Epsilon. And we continued to raise more scholarship money for Chi Epsilon. With all that was going on, I earned quite a, few, quite a number of scholarships. You know, sometimes it's $500, sometimes it's $1,000, but they all helped. So needless to say, I didn't have to execute my strategy of going back, get a job, save, and come back again. Now what's crazier than getting 52 credit hours in one year is that I eventually graduated with my bachelor's and master's in civil engineering in record time with a 4.0 GPA. So what I'm trying to say is that it's not so much the grades or what I learned in the classrooms or being president of Chi Epsilon define the person I am today. It was the help that I received when I needed it most. I truly believe that there were very, very generous people around me, and they believe in a culture of altruism. While our men and women in uniform are the true examples of altruism, many of us do not have that opportunity. So the least that we can do is to help others. So I started my professional career as an engineer here in El Paso. And then later I moved to the Phoenix. But while I was in El Paso, I bought a new house that was pretty exciting. But three years later, I came back to the university and started my first permanent endowment here at, at UTEP. And I named it Anthony Tarquin Endowed Scholarship in Civil Engineering. And Dr. Tarquin is not here today, but he's an amazing person. And he's probably the longest serving professor here at UTEP today. So when I moved to Phoenix, I joined an international consulting firm. And then I started my own business in civil engineering. And I specialize in water and wastewater treatment. I later, later merged my company with an international firm, and I retired soon after that. While I'm retired from engineering, I still run my real estate investment company in Phoenix. This is not the end of the story. Two years ago, I came back to UTEP, and I started my second permanent endowment here. And that's because I wanted to help more students. The first time I started my first endowment is because I wanted to give back what I took. So this is a little bit different. I want to help more students. I'm also trying to set up a wildlife conservation program. And that's because I want to set up a platform so that I can educate people to be better stewards of the, of the land. So this is my new journey. And I want to help future generations. I believe everyone can help. When you receive something, you give something. Give a bit more if you can. I never had a chance to thank each and every one who donated money into a fund which became a scholarship that benefited me. But I know those people are very generous and they did it is because they believe in access to education. Everywhere I travel in the world today, I still look back at Americans being very, very generous, believe in altruism, and a lot of Americans like to donate and help others. We live in a country with near endless opportunities, and we have the infrastructure and the business framework to make your dreams a reality, and that's a fact. So whenever you're asked to help, please help. Whether it's a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, 
they are all very, very significant because they all add up. But you must know that behind each dollar, there is an image of a person that looks like me 30 years ago or an image of a person that looks like you today. My presence here is binary. It's either I'm standing here or I'm not. If I'm not standing here, that meant that my quest for a higher education ended 30 some years ago. And my path would have led me somewhere else. But I am here. And I am sure, years from now, someone else will be standing in front of a group of people delivering the same message about altruism, about access and excellence, and its effect on social mobility. And only then, you know, you have done your part today. So while the stories are many, there's only one message. So remember the message about access and excellence, how it affects people. Don't remember my story. It's the message that's important. So thank you very much. Go out, be kind to each other, be generous, and may God bless you all. Thank you. <laughs>